let's go ahead and get started. So in order to address the idea of growing tomorrow's leadership, the first thing I'll mention is if the only thing you take away from this presentation today is the title, uh, that's a step forward. Uh, the last word is emphasized and capitalized for a reason, and that is that growing tomorrow's leadership, idea of succession plans, is something that's very easy to procrastinate on, very easy to put off. So if you get nothing else other than, hey, maybe I ought to think about this tomorrow, then I've done my job. But beyond that, we're actually going to go into a little bit of detail. In order to do that, we'll start out with a little bit of an academic discussion on what is a leader. Because if you're going to be growing leaders into uh, positions to replace you or key leaders in your organization, you need to figure out what it is that you're going to want out of those leaders. The second question we'll ask is where do these leaders come from? Um, you know, what are the source, uh, the headwaters that you need to look at in, in order to grow leaders from scratch, so to speak? Um, then we'll get more pragmatic. We'll talk a little bit about how to grow a leader and some techniques. Uh, uh, that may apply to, to your situation, I hope, uh, that can be employed. Um, we'll go a little step beyond the basic, though, and talk about how there is a mastery level, so to speak, of developing leaders. That's what I call organizational context. Uh, so we'll go into kind of the uh, leadership development 201 or 301, so to speak, at that point. I'll wrap it up by giving you somewhat of a checklist. I'm a checklist guy, I have military background. And we'll give you some bullet points on things that you can do right now uh, to help grow your future leadership. It's important to note, though, that there's a broad audience on the phone today, and there will be this afternoon as well. Uh, some of you are more senior in the organization, and it's your responsibility to plan on who's going to replace you. Uh, there's others on the phone, and maybe even the majority of the folks on the phone, uh, that are more junior. And you're looking at being those people <laughs> that are going to replace the senior leadership within your organization. So I'm going to speak to both audiences today. And I would ask you kind of to, to look at all that I'm going to present from both of those angles, whether you are the junior leader, which is the, the gold person on the graphic here that I show, or the senior leader, which is the blue person on the graphic. Uh, and again, I'll try to address both. Please do, again, take notes on things that you want to expand on in the Q&A. First, I'll start out with a little bit about me. And the only reason I'm doing this is because uh, uh, I learned a while ago that uh, when you're analyzing a book or any kind of a presentation, it helps to know a little bit about the author's biases. And since I'm the author, I thought I'd share my biases with you or my background so that you kind of know where I'm coming from uh, on some of the things that I'll mention today. Um, I was blessed with a 25-year career uh, in the U.S. Air Force. And what that provided me was a lot of exposure to leadership. And somewhere along there, as I will talk about in a moment, uh, I bit into the apple of leadership, which gave me this, this passion for uh, the whole topic. Um, I followed that on uh, with now about nine years and counting uh, in the corporate world. Uh, so I've had a little bit of both. Um, one thing that might amaze you if you're not a veteran is that the two are not that different. Uh, the missions are certainly different, but the structures are not all that different. Um, in the Air Force, for instance, you'll find office buildings with office suites and admins and a lot of the structure that you're familiar with in your, in your civilian corporation. Um, the, in a civilian corporation, you'll find a lot of people that either are veterans uh, or have learned uh, an appreciation of the military hierarchy and the things that can be learned uh, on leadership in the military. So the two sides tend to learn from each other. And even in academic uh, environments uh, and, and speeches, there are cases, again, where military folks are sent off to civilian schools, Harvard, MIT, uh, to learn that side of leadership or, or just MBA night school classes. And from the civilian side, sometimes uh, there are civilian studies on Sun Tzu's Art of War and other books that really uh, are have elements of leadership that are uh, pertinent to what's done in the civilian corporate world. Now, admittedly, the military is a little more vertical uh, as an organization. There's a little more of a hierarchy. Um, you know, I'm encouraged in my corporation to call our CEO Kelly. That would never happen in the military when talking to a general officer. Uh, but there are good things about that. 
Um, so then corporations are a little more flat. That also gives you some better access, I think, to mentors. Uh, so uh, there are some advantages to more flat organizations. One thing I'd like to point out, though, is that leadership is proactively taught in the military. Uh, and I don't see that as much, at least in my first nine years anyway, I don't see it as much in civilian corporations. That's why organizations like the NMA are critical, I think, to civilian corporate world. Uh, and it's something, though, that you can also champion within your own organization, having talks just about leadership, because there's a lot to talk about. You may see a few books behind me over my, my shoulder here. About half of those are probably on leadership, uh, thanks to your taxpayer dollars. Um, and uh, there really is a lot to learn. There's a lot to study. And so I'm always happy uh, to either study it or address that topic. Um, I was also very fortunate to experience many different levels of leadership. Um, I started out, as all officers do, as a second lieutenant. Uh, which is equivalent to a line supervisor, let's say, in most corporations. And over the 25 years, was able to make my way to colonel, uh, which is roughly equivalent to a corporate VP uh, in a large corporation. Uh, so I've been able to, to see it from a lot of different angles. From size of corporations, um, in my nine years, I started out in a little $2 million uh, small business where I was a big fish in a small pond. Uh, and then work my way up to my current job with Rockwell Collins, where I'm more of a small fish in a big pond. Uh, and I'm privileged to, uh, to work with Lockheed Martin as my primary customer, uh, which last time I counted was over $60 billion corporation. So I'm, I'm going to plan on the, my, my remarks over the next 40 minutes or so applying to all of these. And even including uh, um, talking about 501c3s, and volunteer organizations beyond your corporations. Because I think leadership is not only important, uh, obviously, in your corporation, but the volunteer organizations are always needing strong leaders. Uh, and I think it's just as important there. Uh, and, and you'll get a taste for that, I think, just being the NMA. So let's start out with a little bit of an academic definition. What is a leader? And you can almost take an entire week, and, and they do in the military, just to define this. But I pulled out a definition here that will at least get us started. Um, in the definition you can read on the screen, a person who can enlist the support and aid of others and accomplishment of a common task through the process of social influence. Okay, what is that saying? Well, there's some key items to it. First of all, a leader is a person. Uh, a leader, you know, a, a corporation doesn't lead, a, a business unit doesn't lead, a person is, leads that organization. And that's important to remember. That person needs the support and the aid of others. Um, that is another key factor in leadership is the people that are going to get you there. Um, the people that are going to mentor you, but also the people on your team that are going to help you be successful as a leader. And then along the way, there's some common tasks, some common goal, and you as a communicator leader uh, will need to be able to express that very clearly to your team. What is our common goal? Um, you'll also need to be able to influence people. And I'm, I'm going to break down all of these items here a little bit further in the, what I call the foundational elements of leadership. So what are those foundational elements? Again, this is Scott Chestnut's uh, view on leadership. Uh, but I think you'll find that these uh, are, are pretty uh, common uh, to most definitions. Uh, first thing that I see for an effective leader uh, is passion. Uh, the idea that uh, the person is interested in being a leader may even jump out of bed in the morning uh, wanting to be a leader, and I think that's, that's very important. Experience is also important, and we'll, we'll expand each of these here in just a moment. But experience is the idea that you've been there and done that, um, you've learned some lessons, and you failed a few times, perhaps, and learned from those failures. Um, no one wants to follow a leader who doesn't know what they're doing, obviously, so knowledge is very, very important. But there's some nuances to what kind of knowledge I think are important for leaders. And finally, uh, an element of diplomacy. Uh, able to build a team, able to bring together diverse business units, perhaps, uh, able to communicate well as a diplomat does. These are all four things that senior leaders should look for in the people they're developing. And at the same time, these are four elements that junior leaders should look to develop. 
I would posit that um, if you have a lack of any one of these, you may still achieve a leadership position, but you're not going to be as effective as you could be. So I'm going to use today, just to have a little bit of fun, I'm going to use a Star Trek model of leadership uh, in order to explain uh, each of these four elements in just a little bit more depth. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with that series. Uh, I, I have enjoyed Star Trek for longer than I want to admit, uh, and I'll use the current characters. But when I think of passion, uh, I think of James Tiberius Kirk. Um, he is a guy who obviously enjoys being in the lead, leading people. Uh, so he's very joyful about it. And I think that's important as a leader uh, to be able to share that joy. Uh, and you want to look for young leaders that are able to do that too. Um, people that are joyful are just almost automatically inspirational. Um, it takes a little bit of work to think through what you're going to say or do to inspire your people. Uh, but a happy person inspires pretty easily. Um, when I think of charisma, <laughs> Uh, I think of somebody that I watched last night on the stage, and that's Steve Bailey. Uh, Steve is, is a guy that I just exudes charisma. He attracts people to him. Uh, he does that in a lot of different ways. So I think whenever you get a chance to watch him, uh, I recommend watching him closely. Um, he's joyful about what he does. Uh, he builds people up, uh, which is important. Um, and he has a sense of inclusivity that just draws people in. The last element I'd mention on passion, and this is also near and dear to my heart, is the idea of being in the seat. Now, for James T. Kirk, we see him in the command seat on the bridge of the Enterprise, and that's where he's making decisions uh, and, and, and putting out orders. My own story on in the seat is a little different. Uh, early in my Air Force career, uh, I got the privilege of being an aircraft commander on C-141 transport airplanes. And because it was a transport, it had a crew. And that meant I was leading a team of maybe typically six people or so. And fairly early in that career, I noticed an interesting phenomenon. And that was when I would show up at the airplane in the morning, and it was usually very early in the morning, it was still dark out, you'd see a lot of activity. You'd see the load masters in the back strapping everything down. You'd see the flight engineers checking out the airplane and finishing the refueling. Uh, you'd see the co-pilot programming the navigational system and everybody was off doing their own thing, all individuals. And I could stand next to any one of them and chat with them and talk with them about, you know, it's five minutes to a taxi time and they wouldn't really change their pace very much. But the moment I went to the left seat and sat down and strapped in, everything changed. It was amazing how that worked. I, but no sooner would I have my belt buckle done on the harness and I'd look around, everybody else was strapped in and ready to go. So there's the idea that as a leader, you need to be willing to take that step to be the point person and strap into the seat uh, so that your people will follow you uh, in your vector, whatever that vector is. So what about experience? Now, here I was very tempted to talk about Obi-Wan Kenobi, but I didn't want to mix metaphors, so uh, I'm going to go with Admiral Pike instead. Um, I think in the Star Trek uh, uh, environment, he shows experience. You can kind of see, even from the photo here, a little bit of the gray at the temples. Uh, he's got that long view uh, in his eyes. Uh, he's a guy that's been there and done that. And you actually see in some of the recent movies uh, where he mentors uh, Captain Kirk uh, on some of his lessons learned over the years. Um, I think to be an effective leader, you need to have had some experience, obviously. Uh, but you also need to have been able to learn from those experiences in a way that gives you a certain maturity, uh, it gives you a certain wisdom, and you have a realization that you need to take a look forward a little further than just you know today and tomorrow. Uh, plan and uh, you know execute your leadership in a way that you've got got a long view. Now, this is something that you can't just bequeath on somebody. Um, we had a joke in the Air Force uh, about uh, one of the most effective people that we had in the Air Force were master sergeants. They had been in uh, and as an enlisted member of the Air Force just long enough to gain a lot of experience and knowledge. 
but they still weren't too close to retirement uh, to, to lose some of their effectiveness. And so we had this, this term 17 year master sergeant. And I remember actually uh, having a conversation at a promotion board where somebody mentioned, uh, asked, asked the question, well, we need more of these 17 year master sergeants. How long does it take to make a 17 year uh, master sergeant? Of course, the answer is 17 years. Uh, but that's, there's some depth to that. <laughs> you know, the idea that you need to plan ahead. And if you want to have experienced people in leadership, you need to start them on that path as early as you can. And I think NMA is really good about emphasizing that. Knowledge is another very important factor. Uh, I think as baseline as a leader, Mr. Spock uh, exudes that I think in, in, in Star Trek, uh, he is a walking encyclopedia. Uh, not only does he have depth in his particular assignment, but he also has a breadth of awareness uh, of other um, disciplines around him. So what's, a, what's an example here uh, in your corporation? I know in Rockwell Collins, for instance, that engineering is a big part of what we do. So you'll find that a lot of the senior leaders at Rockwell Collins start out as engineers and the first several years in their job, their, their goal and their assignment really was depth, was to become as deep an engineer, as, as knowledgeable and as qualified as they can in just that one specialty. And that was important because it's, it's important, I think, as a senior leader to be able to show that you can do that, that you can be a deep study. Because by the time you get to a senior leadership level, you're actually a mile deep maybe in one area, but an inch thin in a lot of other areas. So I, I think there's a balance between those two things. Uh, it may be different in your corporation. You know, what is, the, what is the core skill that you need to start out with and get some depth in? Uh, but then as you develop as a leader, it's important to understand the other business units in your corporation. And we'll expand that here in a moment. Uh, talk about enterprise leadership and have an appreciation for how all those parts work together. And that's the breadth of awareness. Finally, from a knowledge perspective, I think it's also important to stay current. So as an engineer, let's say, as an example, um, over the years of developing and as a leader in the company, you may lose touch uh, with what the most current thought is, um, the current techniques, the current advances in engineering. So it's important to go back uh, and stay in touch because again, as a senior leader, another thing you don't want to be is out of touch. And one way to, to, to mitigate that is to stay current on the core skills of your corporation. Finally, we come to diplomacy and uh, in my mind, Lieutenant Ahura is, is uh, one of the diplomats on the crew for several reasons. Number one, her core skill actually is communications. And your core skill and the core skill of the leaders that you're growing should be communicating, um, able to speak uh, as well as write clearly. Why is that important? Well, in order to inspire your team, you're going to need to be able to communicate your vision. And that communication may be through uh, speaking to them. Uh, even speaking to large crowds, uh, or it may be through your written guidance. Uh, but in any case, both of those skills, I think, are very important. And we'll talk in a moment about how to help develop those early in a career. Um, a diplomat as a leader is also a team builder. And I talked a little bit about that uh, previous slide, but the ability to um, be a, um, a go-between between different business units and sometimes even within your own team. Uh, within a diverse team, sometimes there will be uh, disagreements. In fact, sometimes you hope there will be uh, some uh, creative tension in, in the team that will balance uh, your outcome. Uh, but in any case, you are uh, the peacemaker uh, on that team, and that's an important part of, of your leadership skills. And then I mentioned liaison. Liaison is slightly different than, than team builder in my mind. Uh, liaison is a person that's actually going out and bringing together teams that might nev never have intersected. You know, you may find that in your particular pursuit uh, as a leader that you need to bring in a business unit that, that you've never really dealt with before. And that requires being able to go out, uh, learn how to speak their language, uh, and, and be somewhat of a liaison. So... All four of those elements, I think, are important, um, and we'll get back to them in just a moment uh, and apply them pragmatically. 
But let's stay on the train of, of, of kind of the foundation here. And after you ask what foundational elements do you need out of a leader, the next question really is where are you going to get them from? And um, I'm going to discuss a couple different angles on that. The first one is the classic, the age old nature versus nurture. You know, are leaders born or are leaders grown? And in order to, to keep it timely today, I'm just going to cut to the chase and tell you that I think the answer is both. Um, even if you have a natural born leader, somebody who has that uh, proclivity or genetic disposition uh, to be a good leader, um, there's still seasoning that needs to be done uh, as they grow in the organization. Is it possible to create a leader that was not by nature or not born a leader. I think that's that's possible. Um, I think that uh, some people just need maybe a little extra encouragement. Um, but I think the important element there, even more so, is the passion of the individual. Uh, I think that passionate leader can catch up uh, in a lot of cases. So another angle to take, though, on where leaders are coming from is whether the leader is going to come from an external source or come from an internal source, you know, homegrown or outsourced. And I did a little study on this, um, and I sourced down here at the bottom of the slide, uh, HR Magazine, uh, January 15 issue, where they uh, cited a study that they did on homegrown or outsourcing of leaders into the organization. And I was a little surprised, um, because in my environment at Rockwell Collins, my observation is that it's probably about 70% internal, at least. Uh, but what this study found, though, that is across all industries, it was more like 50-50. Um, so uh, I dug into that a little bit and came up with these five bullets that you see that are recommendations for making that decision, whether you go outside your organization or inside your organization. And I think that's just going to be a deliberate decision that you'll have to research on your own as you're growing leaders. Uh, and something as a junior leader that you'll have to consider, again, personally, uh, whether you're going to go up through this organization that you're in and, and enjoy the tenure that you have or whether you're going to sidestep at some point. So what are the considerations? Well, um, one thing that I'll emphasize here and, again, probably in the summary slide is to start with a secession plan. Again, this is easy to procrastinate on. Um, so just taking some time, you know, tomorrow or the next day to think about it is, is a step forward. Uh, think about um, what leaders are going to lead. I mean, we, for instance, we don't like to think that Steve Bailey is ever going to leave the National Management Association. But I'll tell you what, I sure hope that they're starting the plan now because he's, there's some big shoes to fill. And I'm sure the same thing is true in your organization in several key leadership positions. The next thing that HR Magazine came up with in their study was um, to recognize your bias. Uh, are you, do you tend to be biased towards your internal uh, group? Um, and that's typical. Um, recognize that and realize that the situation may demand a change. You know, for instance, if your work group is going into a new area, a new product, you may not have the expertise within your own leadership group to best address that. It may be an opportunity to go outside the organization and bring in a, a little different ingredient into your leadership team. Um, obviously, along with that, you need to describe that role very clearly and early in your succession planning process. Don't just assume uh, that you think you know what kind of generic leader you need. Think about it just a little bit more and make sure that it's compatible with the actual plan that your organization has for that position. And that kind of rolls into the next bullet here, knowing what's unique about your organization, about the role with your organization. So I won't say much more about that. The final thing that was kind of interesting that HR Magazine came up with was that uh, once you've made a decision, commit to integrating that individual. And this is a follow-up uh, to the decision you've made. Obviously, if you're bringing somebody in from outside the organization, uh, you're going to have a greater integration challenge. You may need to spend a little more time with the onboarding, uh, a little more time with their familiarity with your corporation's culture. Uh, but even within the corporation, and this is a little more nuanced, um, sometimes you'll bring somebody in slightly different business unit, or even if it's within the same business unit, 
you need them to make a cultural shift from, from their siloed position that they may have been in to a more broad look. So that is also a challenge for you as a senior leader to be able to write into your mentoring and your succession planning with your junior leaders. Okay, and now I'm going to get to the next slide. Here we go. Um, how do we grow leaders? Now, we, we talked a little bit about the foundational principles. We talked a little bit about where they come from. Once you've made these decisions, let's talk a little bit now about how you can proactively grow leaders. And like I said before, there's two audiences here that I'm speaking to today. The first audience is the senior leaders that should take a proactive role, I think, um, in providing each of these opportunities that we'll talk about. For your junior leaders, I think it's incumbent upon you to take a look at these elements and plan how you are going to proactively pursue each of these. So the senior leaders provide, the junior leaders pursue. I think it's applicable to both audiences. Let's talk a little bit about providing uh, OJT. And actually, before I do that, I'm going to back up here one. Um, I did not put together an expansion slide on, on biting the apple, so, and that's because I just wanted to tell a story here and we'll kind of move on. Um, but as I, as I previewed earlier, the passion element is, uh, is kind of fuzzy. It's something that you can't just teach people. You can't teach them to be passionate. It's something that needs to be inspired. And I'll just tell my own story. Um, in the Air Force, I entered uh, as, as a pilot. Um, that was my primary job. Some other services uh, are a little different about that, but in, in the Air Force, they hire you in as a technician. And um, that was what I was all about. I was very excited about it. Uh, and the first several years of my career, uh, it was all about, about flying. Um, I remember that maybe a couple years into my career uh, that the HR people came around and, and said, hey, we've got this brand new program at the Pentagon where junior leaders can, can get an assignment there and, and really get a leg up early in their career on leadership. And I remember I wanted nothing to do with that. If it didn't have to do with flying an airplane, I was not interested. And uh, I went several years that way. And I look, kind of look back with a little bit of regret. Maybe I didn't take that opportunity, although I took later ones. But um, what it took for me was, as a technician, um, a senior leader at one point deciding, I think it was about four years into my career, uh, to make me a chief pilot, uh, to make me a leader of the other pilots in the squadron. Uh, I found within a short period of time that I really enjoyed that. Uh, I enjoyed leading people. I enjoyed watching them grow uh, and pulling them, them up into other positions in the squadron. Uh, so that was my experience of biting the apple of knowledge, biting the apple of leadership. And that started my passion, uh, so much so that I changed my direction because I was really on my way to the airlines, I think, early on. Uh, but after getting that leadership experience, I decided, you know, I think I may want to stay where, where I am. I, I want to continue this leadership thing. Um, so those opportunities are going to come in different ways in your corporation. Uh, it may come through uh, junior leader participation in the NMA, uh, where you get that, develop that passion for leadership, but it may be something you as a senior leader, uh, need to stage a little bit or provide, provide opportunities uh, for people to get that exposure to see whether they really like it or, or whether they don't. So let me expand on the other three bullets though. Um, Providing OJT. Uh, some of these are maybe a little obvious, but uh, I think they bear uh, just a quick uh, survey. Um, the OJT experience gives the junior leaders uh, a lot of uh, elements that they might not otherwise uh, encounter. You know, and when I say OJT, I'm talking about things like uh, leading a special project uh, where they're in the lead. Uh, whereas otherwise in their technician job, they may not have a leadership position. Um, it may be something as simple as the golf outing, uh, or it may be t-shirt sales or something like that. But in any of these cases, several of these elements are brought out. Learning how to lead others uh, rather than just work themselves, which is really where you start out in an organization. Uh, learning how to win trust and respect from a team, whether it's just a few people. Uh, or more. 
um, learning how to motivate a group, uh, get them all lined up, marching in one direction, so to speak, uh, towards a goal. And then something that really is a lifelong uh, study, and that is striking the right balance between what you delegate to someone and what you keep control of. Uh, and those of us that have been in leadership positions for a while know that this is a, a quite a, a part of the art of leadership and it's something that you develop over experience and over time and, and you adjust. But you're not going to get that opportunity to adjust unless it's created in some cases. Now, I'll, I'll plug NMA again by saying that uh, in some cases for junior leaders, NMA is the only place where they get an opportunity to lead a uh, a subcommittee in their leadership association uh, or lead a project. Uh, so that's another important place where NMA plays a role. Academic study. Um, there's so much out there um, that you can study. As a, as a senior leader, I think it's important to pass along sometimes your book recommendations to your junior leaders uh, through your mentoring sessions. Um, it's also important to uh, pursue some of the other things here uh, that I'll mention. University sponsored programs, for instance. Many corporations uh, will sponsor you for an MBA program for, uh, for graduate education. If not that, uh, there may be some local community college courses that you can pursue on leadership. Um, short of university, like I said, leadership reading lists. I know the chief of staff of the Air Force every year comes out with a a book list of 10 books, and typically several of them are, are leadership type of books. But this is something you can do within your own work group, uh, within your own corporation. And I know, now that I think about it, even the uh, RCLA, the Rockwell Collins Leadership Association, has a kind of a book of the month club that's been started. Uh, things like that, I think, are, are a really good idea. Um, short of that, if you're not really a, a, a book person, uh, there's a lot of periodicals that have great articles uh, on leadership, particularly for, for young leaders. Um, Wall Street Journal. They say on the Wall Street Journal, if you read the Wall Street Journal every day for a year, you get the equivalent of an MBA. Now, I, I'm not sure about that, but that may be true. I, I do know that it's a, uh, a great uh, newspaper that gives a lot of articles on, on both the successes of leaders and, in a lot of cases, the failures. Um, so you get some lesson learned there. Another good source that I think seemed intimidating to me at first, the Harvard Business Review uh, magazine, uh, I, I thought was going to be a rather complex and tiny print and that kind of a thing, but it's really not. It's uh, very readable, uh, and uh, Harvard Business Review actually uh, has a summary page or an executive summary uh, in the back of it where you can get the crib notes on some of the more important articles. Um, so not, not a paid advertisement, and there are others that are like this, but just an example of some periodicals that are also good for study. And as I mentioned before, there may be some currency that you need to keep up in the core technical skills of your particular corporation. And there's various ways to do that. There may be some computer-based programs within your corporation that you can pursue, uh, or um, there may be seminars that you can attend in town. Uh, there are a lot of different ways to pursue technical refreshes, so to speak, in your particular skills. So again, from the senior leader perspective, I would uh, recommend that as you're growing your young leaders that you look to advocate some of these uh, methods of study, in some cases help recommend through mentoring sessions. As a junior leader, I would recommend for you now uh, to start a regular program of, of reading and study. And it may be one hour a week, uh, but I think it's a great habit to get into uh, early on that will help you develop your leadership skills. Finally, we'll talk a little bit about diplomacy and mentoring. Um, one of the strongest uh, techniques for mentoring that I found in, in my years uh, of experience is what I'd call the five-year plan. And this was something I was introduced to by a mentor um, early in my Air, Air Force career. And uh, the reason why five years came up as a magic number was that in the Air Force, uh, with two-year assignments typically, um, if you had a five-year plan, that meant that you were looking at what you wanted to do in your current job uh, throughout the duration of that job. 
what you might want to do as your next job in the corporation to help develop yourself as a leader. And then the, the fifth year kind of represented where are you going with all of this? You know, what might be your eventual goal? So, you know, my example in my case was, you know, let's say I'm chief instructor pilot in a squadron. And, and as part of that, I wanted to, you know, refresh all of the squadron uh, literature and start a, a new safety program. And I wanted to get that done within the time that I was in that job as the chief instructor uh, technician. Um, then looking forward, I had applied to a program, let's say a couple years down the road that was at the headquarters, uh, where it would be a, uh, a leadership administrative position. I'd get to learn more about uh, the whole organization in that time. And then the fifth year might be coming back to the squadron as an assistant director of operations. And you can see from that progression, it's all heading towards something. It's heading towards senior leadership at an aviation track. Now, that's just my example, but you're going to have examples like that within your corporation. So it comes down to five-year plan. How does that vary between the senior and junior leaders? Well, I think, uh, as, as in my case, senior leaders should challenge the junior leaders that they mentor to come up with that plan. Uh, in fact, uh, I even recently challenged one of my sons to come up with that plan. Uh, you know, he's about to graduate from college. Uh, I thought it'd be good for him to think about, you know, finishing strong in college, think about what he's going to do immediately after college, and then think about where that's taking him. And that's really what the beauty of the five-year plan. For the junior person, obviously, don't wait for somebody to ask you for a five-year plan. Uh, start thinking about it now. And it's as easy as setting aside a half an hour and grabbing a whiteboard uh, and just starting to kind of plot out uh, where it is that you want to go, what it is you want to do. And that will help you make decisions on what jobs you might want to apply for and what you might want to communicate to your supervisor as far as your desires. Uh, another mentoring technique is storytelling. And um, I got this technique from uh, the source in the bottom of the screen here, the Sloan Management Review, a summer O2 study that they did. And just real briefly, what they found was that one of the most effective ways to mentor, particularly to a large group, uh, is through storytelling. Uh, very simple, age-old practice where a senior leader would talk about those things that they experienced that made them a better leader. In fact, even last night at the LMLA corporate night, that was one of the Q&A questions from the audience uh, for our keynote speaker, uh, Dale Bennett, who's the executive vice president of their mission systems and training uh, business unit. And they asked Dale, uh, you know, what were some key uh, lessons learned that you had early in your career uh, that led to your ability to handle multi-billion dollar mergers like the Sikorsky acquisition? And he was able to draw a line between the two. Uh, but he did that through storytelling. And if you want more information on that, I'd, I'd refer you to the uh, Sloan article. Let me know, and I can send you a copy of it. But I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Structured coaching is kind of an obvious thing. Uh, as a mentor, um, you know, put together a plan. If you've identified some people that you'd like to groom, let's say, uh, which is legitimate, um, you know, if it's done fairly, um, you know, put together a plan that goes beyond uh, just recognizing them and uh, putting them on a track. You know, think about, you know, when am I going to have lunch with this individual? Uh, you know, what are we going to talk about? What am I going to challenge them on? And that's structured coaching. Uh, benchmarking. The idea of benchmarking is uh, picking out a person that is where you want to be and emulating them. Uh, so you may, it may be something really general, like picking up a book on Abraham Lincoln or, uh, let's, you know, whoever your favorite leader is and doing a deep study on what made them tick. How did they get to where they were as a leader? Uh, or maybe something more specific, uh, somebody in your industry that has done very, very well, um, and doing a little deeper study on how they got there. That's what benchmarking is all about. Finally, uh, I think the mentors can give opportunities to uh, the junior leaders on speaking and writing. Uh, sometimes it's just, it's very uh, sneaky, you know, like, uh, oh, by the way, would you, uh, would you give me a write-up on that, uh, you know, project you did the other day? Just give me two or three paragraphs, you know, and, and we'll share on that. 
um, that gets somebody writing. And, and as part of that, you may give them feedback, not only on the content, but also the forum uh, that they use to, to communicate with you. Speaking opportunities um, happen all over the place. I know NMA uh, gives people an opportunity to, to give uh, seminars uh, at the, the regional CLTs and uh, there are other opportunities for that. There are opportunities in uh, Toastmasters uh, that's fully focused on just giving people speaking opportunities uh, during your spare time. Uh, but I would say as a mentor, uh, emphasize those things to your mentees. And as a junior leader, seek those opportunities. Uh, because I think, uh, as we've talked about before, part of the foundational elements. So what's the 301 or 401 level here? Uh, and we're getting pretty close to, to summarizing, but um, in addition to uh, being able to grow a general leader, so to speak, um, every corporation is going to be just a little bit different. And I've got two different types of corporations on the slide here today. Uh, one is, is a more of a small business, a silo, stovepipe leadership. We don't have a lot of small businesses represented in the NMA. Uh, this may kind of apply, it would kind of apply to a 501c3, uh, but I would say that even, even in volunteer organizations, we might want to look more towards the principle of enterprise leadership. And enterprise leadership is where you have more of a diverse, broad uh, situation where you have multiple business units uh, or multiple corporations that have to work very closely together. So I'm going to spend time on that uh, for the next few minutes and not as much on the, on the siloed. Uh, type leadership example. Uh, once again, I did a little study on this um, and found some, some good uh, research done at MIT, again, um, uh, in their Fall 15 uh, uh, journal. And they came up with several items that were important for the enterprise leader development. And really, it's just the first bullet is the one that I, I would want you to take away. And that is that to be an enterprise leader in corporations like Lockheed Martin and Boeing and Nokia and Rockwell Collins, you need to be both a builder, which is kind of a vertical aspect, and a broker, which is more the horizontal aspect of leadership. Um, and that's learning to appreciate um, that you have to build small teams, but you also need to broker across teams uh, and be that liaison that I talked about earlier. In addition to that, they felt that these other bullets were important. I'll just go through them very quickly. A heightened sense of place, which is what, what they mean by that is knowing your company's identity uh, very well, uh, because sometimes that's how you keep your orientation to true north when you're dealing with a lot of different business units is knowing, you know, what, what is really the ultimate goal of our company. Uh, for Rockwell Collins, we can touch on our slogan of building trust every day. Uh, that's that's an identity for our company. Um, sharp sense of perspective. Um, that is knowing. Um, I'm sorry, I skipped over. No, I got heightened sense of place. Okay, sharp sense of perspective, big picture as well as detail. Um, the idea that you know that big, keeping the big picture is important, but also you, the ability to drill down when you need to, and knowing the difference between the two. Um, a sense of community, that's one of my favorites actually, and that is the idea that networking is important. Not just externally as a salesperson necessarily, but also internal networking. So for instance, if you need something done in contracting uh, to help with your pursuit, you know who to call in contracting. You've got somebody that you've developed a rapport with uh, that's in your Apple contacts or wherever you keep your numbers uh, and that you can reach out to. So networking is important. Um, obviously, a deep sense of purpose, again, kind of similar uh, to knowing the company's identity, uh, but also having a passion about that, uh, about your career and the company. And finally, uh, the abiding sense of resiliency. Uh, again, the study was referring to um, your sense of empowerment to flex, flex, you know, to be able to think on your feet, uh, make changes if you need to as a leader. Uh, but also to be able to get knocked down and stand right back up again. That's the resiliency part of it. Those are all additional uh, kind of mastery levels, what I'd call it, elements of an enterprise leader. And these may not be things that you would develop early in, in your um, 
secession plan or in the pipeline, uh, maybe towards the latter part as you're seizing the person to move into that senior leadership role. All right, so let's get down to the brass tacks here. Uh, what is it that you need to do now? Uh, and I'm going to break it up between senior leaders and junior leaders, and then we'll summarize and get into the Q&A. Steps to take now, senior leaders. First of all, obviously identify what the positions are that you need to fill. Um, that's the starting point. With that, you can then start to develop a succession timeline. How soon do you need somebody? Uh, is it a months away or is it years away? That's going to change uh, how you approach growing leaders into that position. Um, you're gonna need to describe the pipeline. Again, this goes back to our discussion a little bit about your pipeline, whether it's gonna be external or internal, um, uh, whether uh, you're bringing somebody up within your business unit even, or, or, or pulling people over from other business units, which in some cases is great, it's broadening within the corporation. But it's helpful to describe exactly, or as close as you can anyway, that particular pipeline. And then as we've discussed, create on-the-job training opportunities, uh, create academic opportunities or advocate for those in your corporation uh, or your uh, volunteer group and provide mentoring vehicles, uh, whether it's uh, lunches uh, or office chats or whatever it happens to be. Uh, those are things, steps that you can take now. And again, like I said before, uh, if you just take a note to call a couple people tomorrow and get the process started, then I feel like I've succeeded with our, our talk today. Um, I'm going to expand a little bit on the, on the uh, opportunities that you're creating. Uh, and some of these I already mentioned, I'll go through this quickly. Additional duty projects, uh, you know, that is things that are a little bit outside of, of what your young leaders or your junior leaders do now. Uh, whether it's a, a special work related or whether it's a leisure related, it really doesn't matter as long as the, op the opportunity is there to flex muscles on leadership. Um, leadership organizations are important. Again, NMA, uh, very important, I think, to uh, developing younger leaders. Uh, bringing in expert speakers like, for instance, John Maxwell at our annual convention in New Orleans. Uh, written many, many books on leadership. It will be fascinating, I think, to hear him at that convention. But there are other places to go to see expert speakers. I'm a fan. Uh, I and my wife are both fans of Half Price Books. Uh, there's a whole section there on leadership, uh, and uh, you can get those books at a discount. But beyond that, I know particularly for the junior leaders, you may want an ebook, something that you can put carry around with you on your iPad or your phone. Uh, and if you're too busy for those two things, get some CDs. Uh, I don't think I've seen any category of CDs or MP3s that's larger than leadership study and self-help. Uh, and those are things that you can listen to on the way to and from work to make it even easier. Finally. Mentor lunches. Uh, that's a good way to sit down one on one and do do two things here. You know, when you sit down at a lunch with a mentee, uh, you're passing along some knowledge. But the other thing you're doing that's a little more subtle is you're providing a model for that junior leader to aspire to. So I think it's important to remember that when you do have these conversations, don't make it a gripe session. And don't talk about these long hours you're working until 10 or 11 at night. That's not going to provide the model that the junior leader really wants to aspire to, uh, even though it's tempting. Uh, you know, it may be therapeutic. Uh, but I think there's a responsibility as a senior leader to, to paint uh, the bright side of the picture, because that's what will uh, inspire the junior leaders. Um, for junior leaders, what can you do now? Well, think big. Um, think outside your business unit. Think to the things that are going to keep you passionate about being a leader. But at the same time, do the best job you can right where you are because that's what's going to go into your performance report. Uh, so bloom where you are planted. Uh, make your desires known because as your senior leaders are doing these succession plans, they need to know the people that are interested, the people that already have that passion for leadership. I've already mentioned studying, a lot of different ways to do that. Uh, don't wait for somebody to ask you on a five-year plan. Develop it now. And go after all those key attributes that we discussed. Okay, finally, the summary slide. This is the crib notes right here uh, on the entire presentation. So basically, a leader has those four elements of passion, experience, knowledge, and diplomacy. 
I think they're both born and grown internally and externally. Um, you can grow leaders as a senior leader by instilling a passion, providing OJT and the training and mentoring. Um, enterprise leadership as a, a little greater skill level set requires some builder broker skills. And there are steps you can take now, both as a senior leader in succession planning and as a junior leader in being proactive. So hopefully, last uh, little bit here that I've chatted, uh, you picked up maybe a few things. Some of it may have been uh, uh, items that you're already familiar with, but if it does nothing other than to remind you to meditate on this sometime in the next few days, and that's really the point uh, of what I wanted to do today. So with that, I'll ask Sue to uh, open up the lines and I'll take your questions. Well, this is Avis. I can start off. Um, a lot of organizations have strategic plans. And I have seen several cases where really good leaders took that strategic plan and sent it down to his senior leadership and his junior leadership and said, okay, this is the strategic plan for the corporation for the next five years. How do you see you building your five-year plan using with what is in this strategic plan? And in one particular case in a volunteer organization, organization it was very, very effective because it, it put the volunteers into a different way of looking at what they were doing. And when they could see what the strategic plan was and what the goals were and the objectives were for the next five years, then they could sit down and look at that and say, okay, well, this is, you know, if I do this, it's going to help this objective. And until then, they had never been able to think of a five-year plan on their own for what they wanted to do within the volunteer organization. It took that, that strategic plan with those specific goals to get them to thinking. No, I think that's a great point, Avis. Um, strategic planning and leadership kind of go, go hand in hand. And uh, because of that, I've, I've also been exposed to that quite a bit. Um, and, and what I've learned about strategic planning, the first thing is that when you put together a strategic plan, it needs to be a living plan. It needs to be yes. active because one of the greatest dangers of strategic plans is as soon as you're done with them, they go on the shelf and, and collect dust. Um, and I think one of the best ways to keep a strategic plan active is to do is just as you're saying, to integrate it with um, the, the leadership and career planning in your organization. Uh, so that it is real and, um, and, and people are, are kind of maneuvering to that. Um, I, I don't think that's done as often as it could be done. Uh, so I think that's kind of a challenge for all of us to, um, to be able to, to share that around the organization. Sometimes what it takes is, because a lot of these strategic plans are very uh, detailed, uh, what it takes is a senior leader maybe uh, boiling it down uh, getting familiar with the, with the points of the strategic plan. And then, as we talked about communication, being able to clearly communicate uh, the, the top-level points you know, to the junior leaders and how that's going to affect their career planning. Um, I know in the Air Force, we were encouraged to read uh, the National uh, Military Strategy, uh, and that gave us a flavor. Of course, that you didn't really career plan that necessarily. Uh, probably career plan more to uh, a unit strategy, uh, business unit strategy, that type of thing. But, but very important, I, I think, good point. You know, I, I do encourage the volunteer organizations with which I work to do more ahead planning than they do. You know, even a two-year plan is better than just being reactive. And as long as you're reactive, you have problems keeping, a lot of times, uh, keeping your people interested. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, I think, you know, people in an organization want to have a sense of direction. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're always reactive in the organization, whether it's a volunteer organization or a corporate organization, um, there's this tendency of, you know, or this feeling of, uh, 
uh, of being adrift, and and that is not motivating. No, it's not. All thank right. you. Appreciate okay, thank what you. you had to say. Sure, thank you. Okay, other questions? Okay, if uh, a last call, any, any other questions or points from anybody? If not, um, you see my email there at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you think of something later on, uh, feel free to uh, copy down that email and, and send me an email. Um, I'll kind of wrap up by saying um, that I think we're all really fortunate to be part of an organization like the NMA. Um, and I would encourage you to consider uh, attending the West Regional or East Regional, as the case may be, uh, coming up this year. This is a national uh, webcast today. Uh, and potentially uh, also uh, coming out to New Orleans. Uh, I think uh, coming to see uh, both Steve Bailey and John right. Max will be worth the trip. Sue, did you have anything else to add? No, I think you've done a wonderful job today, and I'd like to thank you for uh, doing this presentation for us, and I'm sure everyone obviously learned a lot because they had no questions. <laughs> Maybe that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good job, Scott. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Sue. Uh, thank you all. You all have a great day. And uh, we, uh, just so you know, we'll be doing this again this afternoon uh, at 3 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Yes. So Thank, thanks again, Scott. Okay. Thank uh -huh. you. Bye-bye.